So I'm Dr. Philip Oob. I practice here in Westlake, Texas. Um, and I say that because if you're in Austin, you know that's in Austin. But one of the definitions of an expert is someone who wears a suit and comes from out of town. <laughs> so today I'm from Westlake. That way I am an expert. One of my favorite things to talk about is gut health because as you've probably seen on Facebook or in the media, unless you're reading too many coronavirus news outlets, you've probably at least heard of gut health as it being important. But the idea is still pretty new and pretty fresh and people don't really know what to do with it. And conventional medicine for the most part is, is overlooking it and they don't know what to do with it either. We know it's important. You can see articles coming out saying it is the next step in medicine, but how do we fix it? What is it? How, how, what do we do about it? So I'm a functional medicine doctor, which means I'm a regular family practice doctor, just like all your regular family practice doctors. I'm board certified and I was a regular doctor until I started learning about functional medicine. And basically functional medicine is more about holistic care. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the underlying causes of whatever disease you may have, D, the disease is a bad word, but whatever disease or illness or chronic complaint you have, we find ways to reverse it by looking at the underlying root causes. The things I learned in medical school and residency that were irreversible and impossible to change and you're stuck on this medicine for the rest of your life. In functional medicine, we found how to reverse things that I never thought was even possible including um, dementia, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. There's certain um, damaging things like strokes and heart attacks that are, that are irreversible, but the idea of having thickened arteries that will cause a heart attack can be reversed is, is kind of impossible in conventional medicine. So functional medicine is the idea of finding root causes that have nothing to do with your heart, but ultimately are the thing causing that heart disease. And gut health is pretty much 80% of your health. If you have a broken gut system, you will have chronic illness of some sort, whether that's diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart attack, strokes, dementia, whatever it may be. Even if you don't have any symptoms now, you will eventually have symptoms and it may not have anything to do with the gut. So we don't have much time and I can talk for hours and hours and hours on uh, gut health, uh, but we've got like 30 minutes to do this and then I'll take questions and stuff afterwards. If you don't know, I've got tons of stuff on YouTube. I'm putting together an academy and all kinds of things for people to learn about this because it's not so well known. So just Google my name, look up videos, and you can find way more. There's some cards and stuff out, and um, so if you, uh, we'll get to that stuff. But anyway, let, let, let's jump in. So what are we trying to do today? We're gonna do the basics behind gut health. Um, so what is wrong with my gut? Why does it matter? How do I improve it? And how does gut health affect my BS, my, my blood sugar, right? So I'm gonna somewhat tie it into diabetes, but gut health affects way more than diabetes. So what is wrong with my gut health? There are a lot of people that come to see me and they don't have any gut symptoms. They don't have any bloating, especially dudes. Dudes have no gut symptoms, right? No gut symptoms, but you get everything else. You get the heart attacks and strokes and all that. But everything begins in the gut. Um, I forget who famously quoted it like hundreds of years ago, but it said death begins in the colon, which is your large intestine. And that guy was remarkably true. I think it was like Paracelsus or something. But anyway, what is wrong with my gut? So there can be gut dysfunction, hormone imbalances, poor nutrition, stress, smoking, heavy metals, all that stuff affects your root system. So the idea behind your gut health is that it's kind of beneath the surface. If you look at your trees in your backyard, you don't look at your tree and, and, and think about its roots, but if the leaves are dying or if there's, there's, it's a poor, poor health tree, you're gonna think about, well, I need to water it. I need to put some nutrients on the soil. You're not gonna look at the leaves and try to trim the leaves or anything, right? So that's what conventional medicine is doing, is ignoring the roots underneath the surface, and they're looking at some of the things up above. So in this one, I'm pointing out that, of course, there's yeast overgrowth and stuff beneath the surface, but as, as the tree grows, right, there's type 1 diabetes is one of the branches, and that causes high blood sugar. Once you have high blood sugar, then you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, kidney damage, and all that. And what's conventional medicine doing? Conventional medicine using drugs, they're like, hey, there's an apple on the tree, go get that apple, that apple is the problem. In functional medicine, we, of course, I'm a family practice doctor, so I can help with all that stuff also, but we're down here trying to fix all these things, and then the tree can grow and all those problems just go away. I think what's missing in America and most conventional medicine is that we've lost the belief that our body is an incredible tool and it wants to be better, it wants to be healed. All it needs is the right tools and then it can fix all kinds of things. You gotta give the body more credit, okay? So it's pretty obvious when you look at these two different pictures, right? What's wrong with the grass on the left? 
what's wrong, what's right with the grass on the right? Do you think that grass on the right is eating hamburgers and hot dogs? No. The grass on the left is not being watered, doesn't have any nutrients, and <laughs> looks like Austin in the middle of the summer, right? <laughs> and that is somewhere in, in Louisiana where it's constantly raining and swampy and not flooding. So it's pretty obvious when you look at the lawn why a lawn is good. What's the difference? It's pretty obvious, right? We see the fitness model, she's eating right, she's exercising, she's doing all those good things. What's going on the right? Eating the wrong foods, the gut health has been broken, and thus the system gets out of repair, right? So that's pretty obvious, but we're gonna get even, even more simple. So how is your soil? I want you to think of your gut as your soil, and we're gonna make this pretty, pretty simple, right? The left side is the healthy soil. The, it's not compacted, it's moist, there's lots of nutrients. The right is all clay, nobody wants to dig a hole in here, right? All clay and rocks, that's Austin, and um, lack of nutrients. So how's your soil? Is it compact? Do you not have enough fiber? When you go to the bathroom, we talk a lot about stool, and this is a gut health. Y'all walked in, so we're going to talk about poop, right? <laughs> so when you poop, are you having to push and strain? Does your, does your, do your turds look like rocks and stones? Because you probably don't have enough fiber. Fiber, why do we eat fiber? Not just to have a good bowel movement and feel good about ourselves that day. We eat fiber because we have a symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in our bowels. If you don't feed them, they die and something else grows in its place, right? Your gut is a real estate environment and every house on the market is always taken. There's no availabilities. So if you're not feeding the good guys, guess what? The bad guys are overgrowing. So is your stool compact? You need more fiber. Is your stool moist? Maybe you need more water if it's dry and hard. And then is there any nutrients in your stool? How can you tell? Because it looks different, right? Sometimes you can see the food you ate. If you eat, um, if you eat a bunch of processed food, you don't really see Ritz crackers in your stool, right? But you eat beets, you're gonna see some beets in your stool, right? That was supposed to be a yes. Nobody's <laughs> eating beets. Uh-huh, busted. Okay, beets are wonderful. Um, so. Uh, the, the big deal, I just mentioned that, that symbiotic relationship in, in your bowels as far as you want these good bacteria. You cannot live without these good bacteria. So I, I don't know how much you know about trees. I've learned a lot more trying to teach you guys about gut health. But on the top is what we call a lichen. Okay, and a lichen is, is just this, this like, it's a, it's a biofilm that's growing on the tree. It's a mixture of good, well, we'll say good bacteria, good fungus, and they've, they've formed a symbiotic relationship with the tree. It's not killing the tree. The tree's happy it's there. It's living on the tree because the tree has lots of nutrients, and it's kind of siphoning some of the nutrients. I don't really know that it's doing anything for the trees, so it's maybe not symbiotic, but it's not harmful, right? Whereas the one on the bottom, that tree is dead, right? This tree is rotted, molded. It's, it's been eaten from the inside, and now it just fell off. So what kind of gut do you have? Who are you feeding? Are you feeding the good guys in a symbiotic relationship? Or are you feeding the mold and fungus that's going to eat you from the inside out? Perfect example. You're going to show up, hopefully you're not, but statistically speaking, the most likely thing to kill anyone and everyone in this room is a heart attack or stroke. And why do you think that happens? It has nothing to do with the heart. The heart wants to pump. Your blood vessels want to bring blood. It's inflammation that begins in your bowels that spreads throughout your system and causes heart disease. This is futuristic to think that way, and not a lot of people agree with me, but it's proven. You'll see it coming. One thing that is proven, it makes sense, is that if you have poor dental hygiene, you've probably heard this by now. Nah, I see I had not. All right, good. It's not totally off. If you have poor dental hygiene, meaning you have bacterial growth in your teeth and all kinds of nasty, rotten stuff, you have heart disease sooner and more likely than, anyone, than, than people who have good hygiene. Do you have teeth in your heart? No. How are your teeth connected to your heart? They're not. Chronic inflammation anywhere will cause heart attacks and strokes. The other link that I love is in conventional medicine, I was taught that psoriasis, which is a skin rash. Um, if you have psoriasis, you're more likely to have heart disease. Do you have skin in your heart? No. What's the connection? Inflammation. inflammation, all right. So if you have chronic inflammation in your gut, even if you can't feel it, dudes, you have it, okay? Everyone that comes to see me has eaten the pizza, has eaten the Cheetos, and now we got some work to do, right? I, I'm guilty as charged too. I went 32, 33 years eating the junk food and I paid the price for it. Luckily, everything was reversible, but I learned that this is reversible and that it's causing a problem. So this is for the dudes out there. I don't have gut symptoms. Neither did he. 
So this is, uh, we, I do this all the time, so this is, this is normal to me, but um, this is a stool study, and if anyone's ever done a stool study in conventional medicine, the doctor just says, oh, it's normal, no big deal, moving on. This, in ad, is, this is an advanced stool study, and you can see there's different columns. This guy has an infection. It's kind of a bacterial parasite. He's got inflammation. He's got digestive insufficiency, which means he's not even breaking down his food. He's eating his food, but fats and protein are coming out in his stool because he ain't breaking it down. There's a bacteria making an enzyme that's causing detox issues. His microbiome is in the red zone, and he's got way too many bacteria compared to a healthy person. So he's in trouble and has lots of inflammation. His diagnosis is actually he came in with uh, ulcerative colitis, so he did eventually have gut symptoms afterwards. Um, but his stool study was a wreck. Um, so why is gut health important? Well, I think I've kind of beat that into you guys already, but we're gonna talk about it anyway. So if you don't have good gut health, the first thing that makes the most sense is if you don't have good roots into your soil, you can't absorb anything. So even if you're eating the perfect diet, which we're not, right, you have poor absorption. If you can't absorb your nutrients, things go wrong. That just makes sense, right? You've got foreign invasion. We often think of the, the gut as our customs department. If your customs department is broken, then you're gonna have all kinds of people coming in that you don't really want coming in. You're gonna have bacterial invasion. You're gonna have yeast invasion. You're gonna have all kinds of problems, right? And your immune system is really good. If the customs department goes offline, it just starts killing stuff, which is good because that means you don't die of that infection, but it's bad because that's chronic inflammation that's right and then leaky gut happens when you've got too much going on in the intestines and leaky gut is still somewhat of a new word and i don't have time to give you the whole explanation of leaky gut but just suffice it to say that it's a big problem that causes lots of other issues and then of course there's biological toxins one of my pet peeves in functional medicine in, in general is the word toxins and detox is so loosely used that it's, it just has lost all its purpose. In this scenario, there are bacterial toxins, yeast toxins that we have proven they are there. They are making biochemical warfare in your gut trying to affect your biochemistry so that they can survive. They're not stupid, right? They want to live. How do they live? By suppressing you. Okay, so those are biological toxins affecting you. So each one of those just makes sense. Poor absorption causes nutrient deficiency. Let's go ahead and do the rest. Nutrient deficiency causes fatigue. How many people have fatigue, right? Like 80% of us, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, so if you have good gut health, if you have good hormone balance, fatigue should not be an issue. Foreign invasion causes inflammation, causes heart attacks and strokes. I beat that into you guys. Leaky gut causes autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is a big deal, right? That's why most of you guys are here is because you know someone with type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes um, and all autoimmunity is reversible, which is going to get me in trouble in this conference. But all autoimmunity is 100% reversible. If you don't believe me, go on my Facebook page. I've got markers proving that we have reversed almost, almost any autoimmune condition that I have a marker for and I've seen the patient we've, we've proven reversal for. But the caveat to all autoimmune is reversible is that some autoimmune conditions, like type 1 diabetes, have a permanent destructive effect, okay? So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune process killing pancreatic cells. Once those pancreatic cells are dead, they do not come back to life. But there is still an ongoing autoimmune component even after the pancreatic cells are gone. And I don't know if you all know the statistic, but... 30% of people that have one autoimmune condition develop a second autoimmune condition, right? I see some head nods, so we've heard this. So one of, one of the th reasons why this is important, even if you have someone that already has type 1 diabetes, is that the pancreatic cells may be dead and they will need insulin for the rest of their lives, but the underlying autoimmune process is still going on. It must be reversed or they have a 30% chance of developing a second one. This is so true to one of my patients who had Hashimoto's and she was doing wonderful. I was treating her for a year. She was losing weight. She was doing well, but kind of semi taking it seriously until one day she woke up and she couldn't see out of her left eye and she developed multiple sclerosis while on my treatment plan. I did not like that. She didn't like it either, of course. So we got real serious with her autoimmunity. She started reversing her markers way quicker and figuring things out. Um, come to find out she was growing mold in her kitchen and that was why she developed multiple sclerosis. So mold is a big deal. I will not touch that topic yet, but that's a big one. Okay, so to get back to the practical nature of it, will this tree survive? No, right? So we can't ignore our root system if we're constantly chopping our, our roots off, right? So you gotta feed the roots if you wanna survive. Why is our gut health important? It breaks down our food. You know, I, 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 t I frequently tell people, 
Do you realize how difficult it is to take food and break it down into molecules? Like if I gave you every dollar in the world in an amazing chemistry lab and I gave you a hamburger and said, I want you to break this down into molecules ready for absorption, that would be a lengthy process and none of us would probably be able to figure it out, including myself, right? Yet this little real estate in here can take any food that you put in it and poop comes out, right? It takes the nutrients from it. So we often don't give our gut enough um, credit that it's going to make stomach acid to break our food down. How many people, how many patients are on Prilosec and Nexium and all that crap to neutralize your stomach acid? And you're just like, oh, just take that forever. No big deal. You're neutralizing your stomach acid, a God-given ability for your body to break down nutrients. How can you get nutrients out of food if you can't break it down with acid? And that's the first step after chewing, right? So chew your food, you swallow it, and then stomach acid breaks it down. It's like building a car and the guy on, on, who builds frames is on vacation. The rest of the car is probably going to suck right? So you got to make stomach acid if you want to absorb your food. So digestion is a north to south process. Every step has to work, otherwise the rest of it doesn't, okay? Then once it's broken down, you got to be able to absorb it. So if you have the wrong bacteria, the wrong fungus that's eating your food first, right? They're in the food, so they get first access. You get the crumbs left over. That's not cool. So you got to make sure you have the right guys to absorb the right nutrients. And of course, they protect you. There's a reason babies put everything in their mouth, right? They're trying to analyze their environment. Like, what is, what is in my environment? What bacteria, what yeast, what viruses do I need to be prepared for? They're exposing their immune system to their environment. The majority of your immune system lives in here. It's, it's guessed to be 80% of your immune system lives in your gut. So if you have an autoimmune issue, if you have leaky gut, guess what? It's in your gut. Um, elimination, of course, you got to poop. And um, pooping is supposed to be a daily process, meaning you got to take the trash out every day. Because if you don't take the trash out, guess what? It stays in, right? It, it stinks if you keep it inside too long. So how does gut health affect your blood sugar? That's what we're all wondering. And you know, I don't have a great, I'm not going to give research articles or anything. No, none of you guys don't really want to know that, right? So let's just make some common sense out of it, right? If you can't absorb your nutrients, then you can't run biochemical processes. If you can't run those processes, guess what? You burn less sugar. That just makes sense, right? You got to absorb your nutrients. And when I say nutrients, you guys might be thinking calories. In America, we have been taught that calories is everything. Proteins, fats, and carbs, proteins, fats, and carbs. That, that is the least of your worry when you look at foods. You should be looking at nutrients. And what do I mean by nutrients? I mean the rainbow. Your food should be colorful. If you look at a fast food meal, it's mostly brown and pale and white, right? It's the bun, it's french fries, all that is pale and white. There might be a little strip of lettuce, which doesn't have that much nutrients, and then maybe a tomato that you pick off. You know, that, that's, that's nutrient deficiency. That's plenty calories, but that's not what runs biochemical processes. That's just what's turning the crank. That's not what the crank is. Foreign invasion, inflammation. Inflammation causes insulin, decrease in insulin sensitivity. And I'm sure everyone knows that as a type 1 diabetic. If you have a type 1 diabetic, if they get any kind of virus, any kind of cold, runny nose, if they sneeze, their insulin requirements go up. Why is that? Because that's an inflammatory process which naturally reduces insulin sensitivity. So if you've got a bunch of inflammation going on in here, guess what? You need lots of insulin. That is the reason for type 2 diabetes. You have so much inflammation, so many carbs, so much insulin that your insulin has stopped working and you have to inject more insulin, right? right? Leaky gut at least autoimmunity kills pancreatic cells. We talked about that already. Biological toxins causing biochemical disruptions. So like this mold patient I was telling you about called mul uh, causing multiple sclerosis. She had biochemical disruption. She had poor detoxification. That bacteria is plugging up her detox pathways to gather stuff. So th this is a little graphic, right? But, but I'm trying to drive a point home. Both of these people are nutrient deficient, okay? So there's a big difference. One has calorie overload, one has calorie underload, right? Not enough. But they're both nutrient deficient. All obese people are nutrient deficient, but calorie overload. So the body is trying to run processes, but it can't because it doesn't have the nutrients. So it says, hey, what do I do with all these calories I can't actually use? I'm going to store them, store them as excess fat. So how do we get rid of that? We restore the nutrient deficiency and the, a healthy body is not an overweight body, right? That's one of our famous quotes in functional medicine. A healthy body is not an overweight body. So if you restore the health of the body, weight falls off. Stop counting calories. I'm so sick of counting calories. Um, this is another example, just like the one right there, right? 
one plate is nutrient deficient, both have calories, right? One is nutrient deficient, one's nutrient sufficient. What's the difference? Pale brown, I could have put more foods on there, but that drives the point home. Look at how much colors in here. There's a whole rainbow. There's seeds, there's walnuts, banana, I don't know. So much color. Chia pudding. Hopefully I'll recognize some of those foods. Okay, I hate counting calories. Counting calories is the stupidest thing that was ever invented. You know why? Because your body is incredible. Your body's so incredible that the more calories you eat, the more it burns. It's brilliant. So you're like, this guy over here burning money. Like, he's making plenty of money. He doesn't care about burning it, right? No big deal. This lady over here, she cares a lot. You give her a dollar, it's going to go a lot further. Your body is just like that. You start doing a starvation diet, you start cutting calories, guess what? It's going to be like, I don't know what's going on, but we got less food coming in. So slow down, the, slow down the pumps, decrease the brain function. You'll get fatigued, you'll get depressed. Slow down the energy rates. You'll get cold and you'll start shivering, right? So the body is not dumb. Stop counting calories. That's enough I'll say about that. This is an awesome book for anyone everywhere. Um, it's called The Obesity Code, which I really don't like because it, it sounds like it's only used for people who are obese. But this guy does the most incredible job of breaking down calories. How am I doing on time? Oh. Um, this guy does the most incredible job of breaking down hormones and the hormones behind weight loss and the hormones behind optimal um, nutrition and all that. And he's a big fan of fasting, which I love fasting. Um, but, but basically, he breaks down this calorie overload, calorie underload um, thing really well, and it's wonderful. It's a good read. I think he's Canadian, actually. Uh, so CIFO, this is the most common thing we see in our practice as far as when people come in, they usually have CIFO. It's kind of fun to say CIFO, right? CIFO stands for small intestinal fungal overgrowth, meaning you have too much fungus in your body. How did you get too much fungus? You already have fungus in your body, but every time you took a round of antibiotics, you know how many times did we take rounds of antibiotics for silly things when we were younger? Now we're getting more attuned to maybe I shouldn't take antibiotics because that's not good for my health, but we've taken too many antibiotics and we've eaten too many carbs. As American, we have just eaten too many carbs. Carbs feed yeast, yeast overgrow. Every time you take antibiotics, you kill bacteria and the yeast go, hey, I've got less competition, I'm going to overgrow. And they've developed this foothold over time. Once they have their foothold, they're almost impossible to eradicate. Almost. You need a functional medicine doctor, right? So we can do a stool study and that's what you see in this poor fella. I don't remember who this is, but I might need to look them up because this is a terrible fungus overgrowth. You, usually we just see like one strain. This poor person has three strains and they're overgrowing. So this is proof that they have candida overgrowth and fungus overgrowth. How can you see this in people? Of course, it's just generic inflammation. But if you have any of these things, then you know you have it. So I don't know if you've looked at your tongue recently and you don't have to stick it out in front of me, but I will judge you if you stick it out. Okay. If it's white and covered and hairy looking like that. Yeah. Let's see. She's shaking her head like that's gross, right? Yeah. That's you. <laughs> Not my tongue. <laughs> How'd Google get my tongue? Uh, so if it's, if it's white and hairy like this, it's not. So people frequently think that is yeast overgrowing. That is not actually. I mean, there's going to be yeast on that tongue, clearly. But that's your immune system trying to ward off the yeast. It's trying to grow protective mechanisms. They get the yeast away. So this is just like hair and inflammation trying to push the yeast away. Your tongue is your out. It sounds gross when I say it this way. Your tongue is your outwardmost protrusion of your gut, right? It, it, you may not know this, but your tongue goes all the way down here, right? So that is the furthest you can look inside your intestines is your tongue. So if it's white and nasty, you've probably got other issues. So you can have uh, geographical tongue, inflammation in your tongue, burning spots in your tongue, aphthous ulcers, you know, the little ulcers you get. Those are all signs of gut inflammation and autoimmunity. And I had all of those. Skin rashes are commonly linked to fungus. Actually, that was the first taste of functional medicine I had. I was a conventional medicine doctor, and one of my coworkers came up and was like, look, I reversed my psoriasis by cutting out gluten, and I rolled my eyes and walked off. Like, are you serious? I'm going to have to talk about this. But it's real. It's real. And so yeast overgrowth frequently causes all kinds of eczema, and that's an eczema picture. Um, this is that chapped lip. I don't know if you've ever seen kids with chapped lips that just won't go away. That's usually a fungus issue in addition to dried lips. Any kind of skin rash is commonly fungus. Anyway. I beat that horse to death. So SIBO is the, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So now you have bacteria overgrowth, and I don't mean the good guys, but anything in overgrowth is a bad thing. So if you have too many of one strain of good bacteria, that's a problem. Everything needs to be balanced in the gut in order for you to be operating um, normally. The gut has a trillion bacteria, so that's not rea reality, right? There's not five. Uh, this is one of the coolest things that I thought got discovered. Uh, I've only known about it for a year or two. 
Uh, but I think it's amazing that Klebsiella pneumonia by itself, if you don't know that bacteria, it's worth looking up because every patient, we do a lot of stool studies, pretty much anyone that shows in my practice gets a stool study. Any patient that's got autoimmunity almost always has Klebsiella pneumonia overgrowing their, in their bowels. It's something like 80% based on my limited knowledge. Klebsiella pneumonia is a problem. It's inflammatory, it makes biological toxins. We don't know enough about it. But one of the coolest things it does, it's not cool, it sucks, but one of the coolest things it does is if you eat carbs, it actually ferments it into alcohol. So I don't know if you've ever heard anybody saying, man, when I eat carbs, I get this like brain foggy, drunk, hungover feeling. It's because this bacteria can actually make alcohol in your bowels. It can make so much alcohol that it can cause fatty, that's a fatty liver over there. See how it's yellow and full of fat? It can cause fatty liver in a perfectly healthy, or uh, not healthy, uh, a person who doesn't drink any alcohol. You typically see fatty liver and you're like, oh, you're eating too much sugar. But why? It's because Klebsiella pneumonia can actually make alcohol and cause fatty liver disease. Now, sugar by itself can cause fatty liver disease too, and that is the main cause of fatty liver disease. It is said that, I forget the year, but it is said that hepatitis is the most common cause of uh, hepati um, sorry, cirrhosis, liver failure, and it is said in the next five years that fatty liver is actually going to be the leading cause of liver death. Leaky gut causes autoimmunity. I could talk for another hour just on leaky gut and autoimmunity, but we'll suffice it to say that if you've got a gut inflammation, that your gut is leaking, your gut is a barrier. So if you have leaky gut, you have leaky kidney, you have leaky brain, you have leaky skin, right? So if you've got eczema, you've got leaky skin, bacteria, fungus are trying to invade and your immune system's involved trying to trying to kill it, right? That's why you get the skin rash. That's why you put steroids on it and it goes away. Steroids don't do anything for the bacteria and fungus. It just stops your immune system from reacting. Now the rash goes away. The rash isn't the problem, it's your leaky skin that's the problem. So why do you have leaky skin? Because you have leaky gut. Why do you have leaky gut? Because you have bacterial in invasion, inflammation, whatever it may be. Your, you can't really tell here, but your intestines are a single cell layer thick as far as what has to absorb nutrients. So you're talking about a marine type person like on the front lines protecting itself and having to grab nutrients at the same time. What? Like how is that possible? So any kind of imbalance, any kind of overgrowth or inflammation, these guys start letting go of holding hands. Once they stop holding, see how they're holding hands right here? What's that Red Rover game, right? So the gluten molecule is known to cause this opening amongst many, many, many other things. But once that opening is through, then any molecule, this is an example of gluten, but any molecule, bacteria, fungus, whatever can slip through the cracks. Once something has slipped through the cracks, you have one option, and that is to destroy it, and that's with your immune system. So this is the idea of collateral damage and autoimmunity. So say spinach crosses the gap. Spinach is perfectly fine, but spinach, if I inject it inside your bloodstream, you wouldn't like that very much, right? So when spinach comes inside of your body, your immune system says, that's not good. I'm going to attack it, and I'm going to kill it. But what if a spinach molecule looks just like your thyroid molecule? Now you have an autoimmune problem because spinach is coming across and your immune system is identifying that as foreign and now it's accidentally attacking your thyroid. That is the basis to autoimmunity. So if you can figure out however to seal your gut, whatever protein is coming in that your body's attacking that's causing the autoimmune process, the autoimmune process just goes away. And that's why celiac disease is so fun to study because it has one trigger and that is gluten. You eat gluten, you have celiac disease. You don't eat gluten, you don't have celiac disease. That's how all autoimmune conditions are. You just don't know your trigger. And that's why I have a job. <laughs> so why is gut health important? I'm going to beat this into your head, right? So sugar cravings, you eat more sugar, A1C. So what you may not know, and this I didn't believe until it happened to me, but when you're unhealthy and you have the wrong bacteria, the wrong fungus in your bowels, they're actually pushing your gears and telling you what you should eat, what you should crave. As you get healthier and as you regenerate a healthy microbiome, your cravings actually change. I'm getting a head nod. All right, I like it. Your, your cravings actually change. No one ever, let's be honest, like no one ever craves Brussels sprouts, right? But you tend to develop a, a liking to them where you're like, hey, I like this more. I'm willing to eat it more. Plus, when you eat food and you feel good and then you eat bad food and you feel worse, that's just a mental preparation to say, I don't want to eat that food. But there are actual yeast overgrowth is constantly linked to sugar cravings. And as you kill the yeast, your sugar cravings just go away. Now, sugar will always taste good and sugar will always be addictive. But there's that white knuckle like, oh, I must have sugar right now. That's a craving. That's not normal. Okay. Insulin, all that raises A1C. I don't need to tell you guys. Y'all you you know all that. So gut health causes all those things and raises your A1C if it's, if it's wrong. So how do I improve my gut health? Now, this is a very complicated question. We're going to make it really simple. So I wouldn't have a job if it were this simple. 
So if you have a complicated autoimmune patient or someone who's already had heart attacks or dementia or whatnot, this is a much more complicated process. But for the generic American, you guys, this is what you should do. You should eat real food. It's that simple. Eat real food. And y'all are like, well, what's real food, right? Real food grows, requires sunlight, it breathes, it farts, it poops, right? Those are real foods. So do rich crackers breathe? No. Do they grow? No, right? So that's not real food. That, it's that simple. All those are real foods, right? Eat as much real food as possible, mostly plants. That's the key. That's done. If you do that, your health is in a whole different paradigm. None of this processed food, grocery store crap that we all buy, right? Stick to the rim of the store, the fruits, vegetables, meats. One of my favorite ways to say you should eat whole foods. Everyone always says eat whole foods. I don't mean eat the store, right? But eat whole foods. So what is a whole food? In general, a whole food should be able to get wet. And I always get questions like, what does he mean it should be able to get wet, right? Think about it. If you take an apple and you put it underwater, you just delete it, right? You take Doritos and you put it underwater, I know some of you might still eat it, but you won't <laughs> like it, right? So a whole food should be able to get wet. Now eggs, that's where it kind of falls apart. Like a whole egg, but you put scrambled eggs in water, it's, it's getting a little weird, right? But you can pull it. Anyway, so a whole food should be able to get wet and you should still be able to eat it. Ritz, Doritos, potato chips, all those things, not really good. Um, and then the other thing is the chew factor. How long did it take you to chew it? Did it does it dissolve in your mouth if you leave it there? Because it's probably not healthy if it's just gonna dissolve in your mouth. How do I improve my gut health? <laughs> you gotta water the plant, you gotta fertilize the soil, you gotta spread new seeds. So what does all that mean, right? Water the plant, you gotta eat real food. How do you fertilize the soil? You eat fiber, remember fiber, that hard compacted stool, hard compacted um, ground dirt. Spread new seeds, so that's probiotics, and then you remove the weeds. <laughs> Removing the weeds is mostly what I do in my work. I'll just suffice to say fasting. Fasting is a wonderful tool. No one uses it these days. I should say no one. It's getting more popular. But fasting is wonderful. The way fasting is being used right now, at least in its most popular form, is called intermittent fasting. And that starts something like you do 12-hour fast, meaning you, you finish eating dinner, and the next time you eat in the morning, 12 hours have passed. You eventually want to work your way up to 16 hours, so meaning you would finish eating, this is for most people, they finish eating dinner, they wait 16 hours before they eat again, which means you're skipping breakfast and you're eating lunch. The ability to fast has been lost in our nation because as soon as we wake up, we're eating. As, as we watch TV in the evening, we're eating. So the body is always in an overfed or a fed state, not necessarily overfed, a fed state. So fasting unlocks hormones that aren't used on a regular basis. And these hormones have gotten out of whack because they've been constantly on. Your insulin is on every time you eat. If you're eating all day long, then your body gets, gets sick of hearing it, right? So I like to compare insulin to loud music. Someone who likes loud music, they're going to turn it up. What's going to happen? Their ears are going to get damaged, but they still like loud music. So what do they do? They turn it up louder. Yeah, exactly. More hearing damage. And thus, that's how you develop type 2 diabetes, right? So if you're eating food all day long and you're releasing insulin all day long, the body's like, yeah, 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 we heard it already. So fasting says, oh, wait, where'd the insulin go? Now I'm going to get more sensitive to it when it does decide to come around. Now, the most popular fasting right now, as I just said, is the 16-hour fast. But we're bringing back the 24, 72 hour, even five day fast. Now that sounds absolutely crazy to everyone in the room, right? But it has powerful effects. So earlier I was talking about not counting calories and calorie deficiency, that was stupid, right? How come I can say fasting is cool? Because there's a hormonal difference between complete fasting, that makes no sense whatsoever, but there's a hormonal, hormonal difference between calorie deprivation and fasting. So as the body has less and less calories, it slows down its energy production in order to match the calories coming in. For whatever reason, when you fast and bring the calories down to zero, the body activates. The theory behind it is if you're in Paleolithic times and you're in a cave and you don't have any food, you have two options. You can wither away and die because no one's, you know, Whole Foods isn't delivering food. Amazon Prime is not coming, right? So you, you can either wither away and die or you can activate all systems and say, it's time to find food or we're going to die anyway. So might as well activate everything. So fasting unlocks this archaic DNA that we rarely use and actually activates the body, causes weight loss, causes muscle, muscle growth, regenerates brain cells, all kinds of cool stuff. But don't just jump into a three-day fast, right? You're, you're going to go crazy. 
Oh, so probiotics are wonderful in the sense that they, um, there's, there's numerous kinds out there. The main thing you want to look for when you're buying a probiotic is you want to find as many strains as possible. There's no one strain that has any miraculous power whatsoever. Get as many strains as you can and as many billions as you can. So the general rule of thumb, at least the ones we use, are um, they, they have 25 billion and they have like 12 strains of bacteria. We use two different probiotics. That one's Therabiotic Complete by Claire Labs. There's a, so there's a way to get my slides in a PDF document of 10 ways to reduce your, your blood sugar. That PDF, it's, it's the, these flyers and stuff, if you text a number to this, you'll get an email that has my PDF and has the exact supplements I recommend. Now, you can buy whatever supplement you want. I, I don't care, but it's got the ones that we use. But it's not real food. The probiotics aren't? No. no, the idea is you should already have those probiotics in your belly, but the idea is that you've, we've wrecked our guts over time. That probiotic isn't there. And so what happens is you get that inflammation, that immune response. Probiotics, for whatever reason, have a way to reduce that inflammatory response, reduce that immune system activation. And by reducing the inflammation, you actually improve the, the fertilization of your soil. And then your own probiotics can grow and regenerate. So you don't need to take probiotics forever. You should take probiotics when you have inflammation and gut dysfunction. But as you eat real food and as you grow your own, you don't need them necessarily. So probiotics are used to restore your gut, not necessarily to maintain it. But if you're like me and your diet's not perfect, you can use them to help maintain and kind of keep you out of trouble. So we recommend all of our patients to at least take one probiotic per day, kind of keep the bad juju away, keep the boogie monster away. My favorite probiotic is something called Saccharomyces boulardii, SAC-B. Um, the Saccharomyces boulardii is an interesting probiotic because it's actually a yeast that doesn't grow in the human intestinal tract. Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast that eats other yeast. He kills other yeast. So it's a wonderful probiotic because it, it keeps the yeast at bay kind of deal. And you can take mega doses to kill the yeast. There's other things we use to kill the yeast, but that's one of the best ones. Uh, and the, pro the, one we, the brand we use is from Metagenics it's called Ultraflora Spectrum. And this video is being recorded, so I'll put it up to YouTube later if you guys want to reference back. There's lots of SAC B, Saccharomyces boulardii probiotics out there. Number one thing, um, you got to learn to cook, guys. We got to get back in the kitchen. Studies show that Americans watch more cooking shows than they do actually cooking. <laughs> Guilty, right? I, I don't like cooking shows. My, my skills are pretty basic. Buy a cookbook. If you don't know how to cook, buy a cookbook. One of the cookbooks I have is How to Boil Water. It's my favorite one. Uh, stop watching cooking shows and get in the kitchen. Cook with your kids. You know, you guys, uh, I think a lot of you guys are here for your kids. It, I have uh, kids, oh, my kid only eats chicken nuggets. My kid only eats french fries. The kid is not hungry enough and has alternatives. So if a kid is not eating vegetables, it's because it's not hungry enough. Now that sounds terrible. I, so I, I'm divorced and, and my ex-wife and I had disagreements. And um, when I first got divorced, I started feeding my kids more and more vegetables. And many times they left the vegetables on their plate. But over time, as I exposed them to it, they started eating it. Brussels sprouts was the hardest. But you know how I got them to eat Brussels sprouts? <laughs> I bought um, those, <laughs> what'd you say? Bacon. Yes, as, absolutely, bacon and Brussels sprouts. I, that's what I had last night. Um, so I bought them those, those gloves where you can't cut yourself. And I had my daughter help me cut the Brussels sprouts. And she helped me stir in the oil and the garlic salt and stuff and put it in the air fryer, which is wonderful. And uh, boom, they started eating Brussels sprouts. And now they, they brag that they eat Brussels sprouts. So a kid will eat vegetables. One of the famous quotes I heard from Emily Gutierrez, who's a functional medicine pediatrician, she says, you are not responsible for what your kid eats, right? You can't force them to eat anything. But what you are responsible for is what you put in front of them. So if you're, if you're putting a good dinner in front of them and letting them not eat it and then giving them animal crackers, leave the food on the plate. If they don't eat it, that's okay. Guess what? A kid will get hungry enough and eventually eat it. One of my patients pulled up, I'm, I'm rambling. One of my patients pulled off the most incredible thing. I don't know if y'all know what GAPS diet is, but it is ridiculous. It's hard for even adults to do. And they decided they were going to do the GAPS diet for their four-year-old autistic child, which worked, by the way. The GAPS diet is in incredibly restrictive. For four days, this child didn't eat a thing. Thing. And then the, the wife was ready to throw in the towel, uh, oddly enough, backwards, right? The wife is ready to throw in the towel. It was her idea, and she said, I can't do it. I can't starve my child like this. The husband said, 
let's give him one more day. Like tomorrow we'll feed him if, we, if he doesn't eat anything. And sure enough, on the fifth day, they could not feed this kid enough GAPS food to, to suffice him. They had to go to the grocery store and get more. So if a kid won't, I'm not suggesting starving your children for four days, okay? But start introducing things slowly. That's what I'll say about that. And of course, experiment. Sun basket, blue apron. There's, there's all kinds of food delivery stuff now. There's no excuse for not cooking fun food. Buy a book. Mark Hyman's my idol. Love him. Um, his, well, it's not his most recent book anymore, but food, what the heck should I eat? It's so complicated now. Eat whole foods. Eat real foods. It's pretty simple. But he goes through and, and lays out the foundation. His other book that's my favorite is uh, Eat Fat, Get Thin. The idea is that we eat way too much sugar and carbs. If we eat more fat, we'll actually lose weight. Carbs and, and sugar make us, make us fat. So I've got tons of videos out there. Um, I, I'm trying to get a more consolidated way to walk people A to Z, how to get healthier. And so I've got an online academy that's kind of in the works right now. But I've got stuff on YouTube, and it's a little scattered brain, so I'm working on making it more um, A to Z. So this is what I was talking about. If you all text the word blood sugar to that phone number, it'll actually spit you out an email that's got my PDF of 10 things to reduce your blood sugar. It's got more than I talked about today. And then um, it, it'll also send you the PowerPoint slides if, if you need that. So I think we have to 11.30. I think I did okay. Um, what questions do you guys have? Yes. So a lot of these sugar alternatives like stevia, monk fruit, allulose, is that stuff bad for our guts or how does that play in our microbiome? Good question. So I'm going to repeat it from my microphone. So he asked, what about sweeteners? Uh, are they okay for your gut health, basically? So he said the right sweeteners, which was A plus for that guy. What's your name? Kurt. Kurt. All right. So he said the right sweeteners. The right sweeteners are stevia, monk fruit. I wasn't familiar with the third one you said. Uh, allulose. Allulose. I don't know what allulose is. The, the, most, the healthy two are stevia and monk fruit. But we want to be careful with sweeteners. All the other ones are bad. Why are they bad? The, the simple answer is that they're fake sweeteners. They are chemicals. They are man-made. So a bacteria is a pretty stupid organism. It's archaic, right? So it has this ability to break down sugar and turn energy into it. But if you feed it a fake sugar, it thinks it's a sugar, and it tries to use it as energy, but it's not a real sugar, so it can't use it, and so it dies, right? So fake sweeteners, not stevia monk fruit, kill off good bacteria that you want in your system. And, and, and that's the idea behind why people who drink diet soda are fatter than people who drink regular soda. That's always been mind blowing to me, but that's the idea behind it. So the, all the other sweeteners are bad. And I will even extend that the stevia and monk fruit is overused. You want to use as little sweetener as possible. And the idea behind that is actually completely different than what goes on in the gut. The idea is that you're, the sweeteners are way sweeter than sugar, right? If you do a tablespoon to tablespoon, a tablespoon of sweetener goes a lot further. So the idea is your taste buds get acclimated to sweetness, and then it starts looking for that same level of sweetness. One of the things we commonly do with patients, of course, is fasting and, and, and sugar detoxes and all that. And it's amazing after you haven't eaten sugar for three weeks, when you take a bite of an apple, you're like, oh my God, that's so sweet. And you're like, what? That's an apple. Like, why is an apple that sweet, right? Your level of sensitivity to that sugar can change. So the more sweeteners you use, the more sweetness your body looks, your tongue, your, your brain looks for in its environment. So keep it to a minimum because you end up eating more sugar. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Ah, oh, I love talking about this. Thank you for asking. So should we eat organic? Um, the answer is always eat organic when possible. But there, there's a resource out there by EWG, Environmental Working Group. They're a nonprofit, blah, blah, blah. They have published two lists, and I tell everyone to, to look into these. One is called the Dirty Dozen. That is, do not eat these foods if you can buy organic. I mean, there are things like strawberries. Like, if you can't afford the organic strawberries, I'd much rather you eat strawberries than Ritz crackers, right? So I think that's where people get lost in the organic. It's like, oh, I'm not supposed to eat that unless it's organic. Like, no, eat the strawberries. They're healthier for you than the other things. So let's keep it practical, right? So buy organic. Strawberries is one of the top on the list, unfortunately. So buy organic strawberries. But this dirty dozen list, it says these are the 12 most toxic foods and how we grow them. So buy those organic if you can. Um, and then the, all, they also um, have a counter list that's clean 15. It says, hey, these foods are grown pretty well already, so you don't have to buy them organic. The easiest way, I'm so proud I taught my mom, I taught you this mom, that if you're at the grocery store and you're not sure and you don't have your phone, it's an app, Dirty Dozen, look up Dirty Dozen, it, it's on there. Um, if you don't know whether to buy organic or not, just look and see if you eat the skin. Okay, so we're gonna do a test. Do you eat the skin of an avocado? 
Okay, I was going to be worried about some of you. You know, you accidentally get some in your teeth, and you're like, oh, man, that was got a little skin. Uh, don't use a serrated knife, right? I've done that before. Anyway, so if you don't eat the skin, you don't have to buy it organic. Why? Because the pesticides and stuff are sprayed on the outside. So if you're peeling off the pesticide layer, you can buy that non-organic. And organic avocados are like two, three times the price sometimes. So non-organic. Grapes, do you eat the skin? Yeah, buy those organic. Strawberries, do you eat the skin? Yes, buy them organic. Bananas? No, so you can buy those non-organic. Corn. Yeah, no, no. Ah, <laughs> so they have a husk, right? That one always trips me out. Corn has it. Well, you don't see the husk anymore. Who's, when's the last time anybody buys husk of corn, right? What? Okay, I'm the lazy one. Well, I don't buy corn, but anyway. All right, props to you guys for husking your own corn. Uh, so yeah, it's got, you don't, you technically eat the skin, but the husk protects it, right? Corn is one of the dirtiest crops, though, so that one's surprising that you could eat it non-organic. Uh, good question. Yes, ma'am. So could you speak to um, oils? Because that's been reading a little bit about how do you invest in that oil? Terrible things. Terrible issues. Everything issues, really. So wh the question is, what kind of oil should we be eating? How do we use those oils? I could talk about oils all day long. It, to get the real breakdown on that, Mark Hyman's book, Eat Fat, Get Thin, goes into way more detail than I can ever understand. But we're, this is for practical. We're going to keep this real, right? So the easiest thing to do in the oil world is throw away all your other crappy oils and buy only avocado, olive, and coconut. Those are your three primary oils. And actually, I want you to use less olive oil. Too many people are cooking with olive oil. Olive oil has a really low smoke point. So olive oil is wonderful and has all these amazing benefits and all this stuff, but if you cook it, it turns into a bad oil. That's why vegetable oils and things are wonderful because you can cook, you can fry the hell out of them, right? And they don't turn bad. Why is that? Because they're fake oils, they're crappy, they're, they're, they're not good. So throw away your vegetable oils. Mom, you too, throw away the vegetable oil. Stop using it, right? Um, or, and when you buy an oil, always try to get an organic one. Always try to get a cold pressed extra virgin version. But don't get too crazy. If you're using avocado and coconut, you can cook avocado and coconut oil at any temperature and be fine. Olive oil is the one that has a lower smoke point. So really olive oil is meant for low heat cooking or to be drizzled on after you're done cooking the meal. Good question. Do you have oil with peanut oil? I generally stick to those three and leave it there. I don't think peanut oil is good. I forget why though. Yes, sir. Uh, so th that's a good question. So my personal opinion, because there's a lot out there, is GMOs are bad, right? We've genetically modified plants, and that's probably not a good thing. Um, but the, the way I kind of see things is GMOs are here forever, whether we outlaw them or whatnot. They are in our environment, and they will never go anywhere. So unfortunately, that's, that's a truth. But what's, what's bad about GMOs is not necessarily the plant. It's what you do to a GMO plant. So the whole idea is Monsanto has created these GMOs and you can spray as much Roundup as you want on corn and the corn won't die, only the weeds die. So what makes a plant protected from this weed killer is not a chemical. The plant doesn't make a chemical, right? The plant usually makes a protein of some sort that disables the Roundup or work around the Roundup or somehow isn't affected by the Roundup. So it's not necessarily the GMO that's the problem because it's not making a toxic byproduct. It's the toxic product you're spraying on the GMO. So, I mean, GMO corn has invaded the world and will be here forever. I don't think if you grow GMO corn organically that it's dangerous. I think it's perfectly fine. I would rather GMO has never been admitted, but uh, that's my take on it. Yeah. Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, someone else? Harry Tongue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Eat real food. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, those are, those are complicated chronic illnesses, and unfortunately chemo is poison, right? It is designed to kill humans, human cancer cells, but it kills humans too, right? It, it, it hurts. It, it, it has a lasting effect, and we can't, um, you can't take that back, right? That, that's done. That's there. But the thing you can do, and I usually promise, my, I, I don't make any promises to my cancer patients. I don't say I can reverse cancer. That's the one thing that I'm just, I'm not ready to, to bite off yet. Um, 
But what we can do is we can make your body as healthy as possible so that it's not as damaged by the chemo or you have less side effects from the chemo. Um, you have less inflammation around the osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is one of those chronic inflammatory conditions caused by poor gut health and la la la, all that stuff, right? That's already happened. But once you, just like the type one diabetes, once those joints are destroyed, that destruction is there to stay. So you have two options though, once, those, once that destruction is set in, one, you can reduce your overall inflammation, and so you will feel less pain because you will have less pain and inflammation in that joint. The joint is still partially destroyed and still there. But number two thing, I don't know if you all heard about stem cells, but stem cells are amazing for osteoarthritis. Um, I won't make any promises since I'm on cancer, but stem cells have worked incredible for my patients with osteoarthritis. My one pet peeve with stem cells and people doing stem cells is that the, the doctors that are doing stem cells just say, here, I'll take your money and I'll inject you with your own stem cells and they work great, that's all wonderful. Except if you're harvesting your own stem cells and your body is in disrepair and broken, do you think your stem cells are gonna work? No. So one of my requirements for all of the stem cell patients that I treat, including for knees, we just did two last week, is that you gotta be healthy enough. I'm not gonna take your money. I'm not gonna waste your money. We'll do it, but your body has to be healthy enough and you have to have legitimate, ready to go stem cells in order for me to harvest it and it work. So I think that's the big problem why stem cells get somewhat of a negative um, connotation is because it doesn't work for everyone. But if you're eating cheeseburgers, do you think your stem cells are working? Probably not. Stem cells are not a drug, they're live cells. So if those live cells are damaged and disrepair, they ain't gonna repair your joints either. Absolutely. I mean, you've got a kind of ground up. So those 10 things I listed in that PDF, that's a perfect place to start. The 10 things I listed are big, they're big wins, the, the high yield wins. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh Lord, <laughs> now we're getting kooky, all right. Uh, so the number one question was, um, is it the pesticides in gluten or is it the gluten causing the issue? And I, in my opinion, I think it's both and it's impossible to separate the two. Um, uh, gluten and grains in general are heavily um, laden with pesticides and toxins. It, 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 there's multiple problems with grains in general. Gluten's easy to pick on because it causes obvious disease. It's the number one food to eliminate for anyone and everyone. Everyone in this room, anyone, everyone should remove gluten and dairy. No questions asked. There, that is not easy. That's easy to say. I have done it. It was a lot of pain, a lot of complaining, a lot of whining. There were tears involved. But once you remove it, it's actually really easy to not eat it anymore. But as an American, it is 90% of your diet, whether you like it or not. But to get back to your question, um, gluten is especially problematic because we've done a few things in America. One, we've made our grains that carry wheat, we've made wheat more gluten. It actually carries more gluten than it's ever done before. We've hybridized it in order to carry more gluten because gluten is what makes the bread sticky and, and, and puffy and it's actually what holds all the air and makes it yummy and delicious. Um, so there's more gluten. They've manu the, the gluten molecule has changed um, and because it's changed, it's harder to digest and it causes more reaction. And then you cover it with, with pesticides and toxins. So it's like strapping an atom bomb to an inflammatory protein and now you have an issue. The number one reason why I think gluten causes an issue for most people is because we eat it as Americans for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between. I don't care if you eat strawberries for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between, you'd probably have an issue with strawberries. We were never intended to eat the same food day after day after day. The only reason we have grain products day after day after day is because we store it in silos and we slowly release it when it's not harvest season, right? We're never supposed to eat the same food every day. And gluten and dairy are the two things, I don't care who you are, at some point in your life, you've eaten for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? The Pop-Tart for breakfast, I've done it. The cereal for breakfast, the yogurt for a snack in between, the sandwich with cheese on it, the pasta for dinner. I don't know if you notice, and you put Parmesan on top, right? So that's gluten and dairy at every meal, the cheese and crackers that you eat at snack. So it's, it's, a, it's a volume standpoint, from my opinion. You can, there's the, there's, the immune system gets irritated if you feed it the same thing over and over and over again. Um, your sec second question was? Apple oh, apple cider vinegar. I think apple cider vinegar is mostly a, a miraculous hoax for the most part. People swear by it. 
I, you're more than welcome to do it. It's got probiotics. It's an acid. It's a vinegar, right? So it, it helps digest food in your stomach. I've got several patients that swear they do it every day. It's nasty to me, so I'm biased against it. I cannot do it. So apple cider vinegar is cool and wonderful and magical. I don't know how it works, but people swear by it. Every day, every day. It's magic. Look it up. I mean, that's why the vinegar cures everything. <laughs> Cancer, warts. Nasty. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were talking about real food. I cook 90% of the family's uh, meals. Good for you. We try to eat healthy. What's your stance on rice and red meat? So red meat has been exonerated. Red meat is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with red meat. It does not cause cancer and, da, 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 and all that crap that we've been led to believe. Saturated fats have been exonerated. Meat is not bad. Meat that's raised improperly is bad. You feed a cow corn. Cows have never eaten corn before in their entire lives. You feed a cow corn, that changes their microbiome, changes their gut, right? Mm -hmm. You change a cow's gut, guess what? Its body parts are inflammatory and bad also, right? So how you raise the cow matters a whole lot more than the cow itself, okay? Kale is no different. So kale is wonderful, it's a superfood, blah, 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 all these great things. You, go, you grow kale in an arsenic-laden field, guess what? Kale is so good at detoxifying, it detoxifies the soil and it collects it and then you eat the kale. Well, the cow is no different. You grow a cow on poor soil with poor diet, you got a toxic cow. So that's the link to red meat and problems is how the cows were raised. And then number two, what do we do to our barbecue, right? We burn it. You burn it. You like those crisp ends, those black marks. That's what makes it taste good and sweet. Well, those black marks are dioxins. Those are cancer-causing agents. I don't care if you overcook broccoli. If you burn broccoli, we all like it, don't lie. But when you burn broccoli, those are dioxin cancer-causing agents. But nobody's looking at broccoli to cause cancer, right? They're all looking at red meat and bacon to cause cancer. So you burn anything, you create cancer-causing agents. That's the same idea as eating organic. Eat grass-fed when possible. If you can't get grass-fed, then maybe limit the meat. Eat mostly plants. When you look down at your plate, 80% should be plants. And rice. Oh, and rice. So in general, I'm a, I'm a no-grain person. I don't eat any grains. No corn, no rice, no quinoa, no oatmeal, no grains whatsoever. For you guys, you should start with no gluten and start limiting your rice. So rice is the, the perfect example is um, get there, get there, get there. That's what rice does to you, right? Rice has no nutrients. So rice will make you fat if you have other calorie sources. If you only eat rice and have no protein and no other nutrients, this is what happens to you. This is called marasmus. See how his belly's really swollen? It's all fluid just built up. His only access to food is rice. So he's calorie deficient and nutrient deficient. So in general, grains are pointless. They're just calories. And one of the ideas is if you eat calories without nutrients, then you're full and don't have room for the nutrient laden foods, right? So if you start removing rice and if you start removing nutrient devoid foods, you're still hungry. And what are you going to go eat is the question. Are you going to eat nutrient-dense food or more junk food? Thank you. Good question. Psyllium husk. Psyllium husk. So it's wonderful. It, so psyllium husk is a fiber, uh, both soluble and insoluble fiber, I believe. Um, and so psyllium husk is wonderful. It helps increase the fiber content. But the, the thing, anytime you process things, you lose certain things, right? So if you're taking a, fi a food with fiber, you're extracting the psyllium husk, You've got the fiber, but you lost all the nutrients. So by all means, take as much fiber as you want to. That's actually one of the top 10 things I recommend is eat more fiber and add more fiber. I guarantee you, none of us, including myself, are eating as much recommended fiber a day. 50 to 60 grams, my jaw's tired. Yeah, I agree. Like, I, my, ah, I'm like sore just thinking about chewing 50 grams of fiber. So eat as much fiber as you can in real food. Supplement when you need to. My favorite thing to supplement with fiber, though, is, is ground flax seeds. So I make a protein shake every morning. Not that that makes you healthy by any means. But if anyone makes any, sh any shake whatsoever, dump a big tablespoon of, of organic ground flax seed. Man, that is wonderful. You get all the healthy plant-based omega-3s from it. You get the fiber from it just amazing and it has like no taste good question what else you guys have good questions yes ma'am organic what okay yeah 
So what I would say, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I've heard a lot of, uh, of all the, not the sour, um, uh, sourdough bread that have no gluten and whatnot. Um, so my general take on anything that's reduced gluten or low gluten or ancient or whatnot, um, if someone had an allergy to bee stings, would you say like, well, this one's a small bee. Like it's okay if you get stung by a small bee. The idea is that we've, we've, our immune system has been already irritated by gluten. So any exposure causes inflammation. Now, over time, as you've been gluten-free, your body starts to kind of forget about it after a while, and you can start adding it back in in small quantities, listening to your body. So that would be one where I would typically, in the beginning, when I'm working with a patient, because usually when patients come to see me, they're already broken. They've seen eight to 10 doctors. They're ready to do anything. No gluten, no dairy, remove grains. We'll take other foods out. I'll spare you guys. Um, and then eventually, after they're healed, then they can go to the birthday party and have the cake. And you know what? They feel fine. Great. I have it every now and then. That's how I treat myself. But um, we also teach patients to be body aware. If you eat that bread from einkorn, how do you feel? Do you feel good? If you do, keep eating it. You know, this isn't a dictatorship. Yes, sir. Good question. Um, I, I, so no, yeah, it shouldn't. I mean, there's no problem with drinking before or after or during meals. Um, I think in general, Americans eat too quickly. Uh, and so drinking more water during the meal happens to fill the stomach and maybe can bring your satiety centers um, to rest sooner. But yeah, I don't see, I don't really have an opinion much. I, I personally am one that eats my meal and then drinks water. I don't know why. So yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm a big, big, I, I, we talk a lot about water. Our water supply is so adulterated in this nation. I see everybody's got kind of their bottled water and stuff. Our, 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 it doesn't matter where you get your water, whether it's from the city, which is the most toxic water. Do not ever drink city water. Don't drink water from your fridge. That fridge filter is stupid. It doesn't do anything. Sure, there won't be like grit in your water through your water filter in your fridge, but it doesn't actually do anything but remove grit. Um, get a real water filter that actually removes chemicals um, and heavy metals, fluoride, all that stuff. Never trust a bottled water company to tell you it's from some spring fed, somewhere magical. Yeah, like never believe it. And then it's in a plastic bottle. So of course there's the chemicals that come with. Do you don't have to hide your plastic bottle? I'm not getting on to you. <laughs> We all, we all do it every now and then. I mean, so the idea is, you know, I'd rather you drink bottled water than the faucet outside. But at home, you need to be bringing water. Like I, I have, I'm such a nerd. I bring my own water from home through a reverse osmosis water. Oh, it's in my car. Um, through a reverse osmosis water filter. That's one of the, the easiest things to install in your sink. Um, you can get a Berkey water filter, which is a, a standalone on your counter. I, they even have now a reverse osmosis system that um, you can put on your counter without having to install all the plumbing and stuff. But filter your own water. Don't trust anyone. Don't trust your taste buds to identify chemicals. Do you taste the Teflon when you cook food in your Teflon pot? No, that has no taste. So don't trust drinking the water and be like, tastes okay. But I'd rather you drink water than soda, right? What about the high pH water? Uh, high pH water is bullshit. <laughs> High pH, the alkaline water. I, I'm sorry for anyone that got offended when I say that. I, the idea is your stomach makes acid. Why are you trying to neutralize it? I, 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 it's like drinking Tums. It's like eating Tums and drinking water. That's stupid. If you want high pH water, just buy Tums and drink the water. Like, it's the same thing. So alkaline water is stupid. I mean, maybe you're filtering it and getting alkaline water too, so it's pure alkaline water. Great, that's cool. But you don't need alkaline water, no. I hope you didn't spend $3,000 on one of those fancy machines. Okay, good. That con congen water, whatever, that brews tea in cold water. It's like, that's, tea should never turn to tea in cold water. I don't know if y'all have seen that commercial yet. It's stupid. Don't do it. Yeah. I'm pretty opinionated if you don't know. So ask me anything. I'm, I'll tell you. So in, in the, I like, I drink a lot of tea and I, naturally, I just made with water, so that's like the only water. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the, Chinese and Asia in general, they drink a ton of tea and they, they've lived a lot longer than, than we have until we brought McDonald's over there. <laughs> they started dropping faster than we do. So um, yeah, tea is wonderful. In general, green tea, you wanna watch the temperature. I mean, we can get crazy over tea. Um, green tea is the best. Don't cook it too hot. You actually change what comes out of the tea when you, when you boil it too hot, little things. Green tea is good, don't put sugar in it. Limit your stevia and monk fruit. 
Don't put milk in it either, you British. What else? Anything else? I don't know if I've gone over time. I don't know if they haven't kicked us out yet. All right. Nothing else? So a couple things to remind you guys. I put, oh, thank you. I, I, you don't have to do that. I put a ton of business cards out. Please take as many as you want because we're moving and this address is not going to be real any longer. So take as many business cards, pass them out to whoever wants to hear. I've got tons of videos online. Please look them up, learn more. And then, of course, grab one of these handouts or text that number at the end. Where is it? Just text blood sugar to that number and it'll send you an email with the PDF and, and PowerPoint stuff. So eat real food, guys. That's the best thing you can do for your health. Y'all have been great.